Hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks for making it out to the first session after the party. I appreciate that. Um, we're going to be talking about the easy and secure way to build JavaScript web apps with OAuth 2 and OADC. Uh, so my name is Jake Fiesel. I'm a developer at Fordrock, and I've uh, been with Fordrock for about seven years now. Originally, I was a UI developer. Now I'm the developer experience uh, engineer, lead engineer. Um, given the fact that I've got a UI background, it somewhat makes sense that I am going to be thinking a lot about single page apps, something that I have done a lot at my time at Ford Drive. And just as a quick, so there's no surprises, there's a couple of libraries that we're going to be uh, discussing down the line, and here they are. Uh, there's uh, two of them that I've been working on. One's called App Auth Helper, and one's called OIDC Session Check. And we're going to get into those details about what those do uh, here in a little bit. Now, <clears throat> the uh, let's see, is this working? There we go. Um, so for some context, um, we've been talking a lot about single page apps here at Identiverse for the last few days. And I actually really hope that you guys all went to um, Brock Allen, uh, Philip Durick, and um, Dan McNulty's talks yesterday. Um, and if you haven't, if you didn't go to those, if you weren't able to make it, I really su suggest you watch their videos because they're almost as if they were by design, uh, very complimentary for this discussion. Uh, so uh, it, it turns out that we just happen to be very simpatico in that way. So the idea here, in case you didn't see those or you're not sure quite what I'm trying to get at, is we're talking about JavaScript web apps, that is uh, apps that run entirely in the browser. There's no back-end execution environment. Uh, and they want to operate as an OAuth 2 um, client or an OADC reliant party, whichever way you want to think about them. And these, are, these clients uh, are intended to be making REST calls to resource server endpoints. So they'll be making calls that have bare tokens that they got issued from the authorization server. And importantly, this client app is going to be driven by the actual user that was authorized. You know, it's only going to be making actions that are essentially in response to the user's own action. So there's not going to be any kind of offline processing or anything like that. So that's the type of apps we're talking about. Now, there's a bunch of current best practices out there that uh, apply to different kinds of clients. Um, some of them uh, are more or less applicable to single page apps. And um, I've been doing my best to try and figure out what some of those things are. And we can uh, go over some of those concerns that seem to be speci specifically applicable to single page apps. And now this is something that shouldn't come as any surprise if you've been in some of these other sessions. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about whether the implicit grant is still valid uh, for access tokens, um, uh, because based on a lot of the things you would see online currently, there's a lot of, quite a lot of material actually that suggests you sh should still use implicit grants. Um, but not the best practices. Uh, current, best current practices suggest that you shouldn't use it anymore. And like I said, lots of people here have confirmed that. Essentially, everyone is saying, don't use implicit anymore. And there's very good reasons for that. Essentially, they're just more vulnerable to token leakage. And um, essentially, it boils down to just don't use them. And that's the best. I mean, it couldn't be more clear than that line there. Should not use the implicit grant. They should instead use response type of code, which is the authorization code grant. So that's pretty open and shut, right? Um, Basically, we just need to update a lot of the documentation that's out there, a lot of the libraries, and start moving people away from implicit grant, even for single page apps, even, which is, you know, you'd be forgiven for thinking that because if you go to the original draft, it still says essentially use implicit grant for single page apps. Well, it's definitely time to start updating uh, the documentation libraries. Now, the next question is the use of Pixie. Now, again, this is something that you might not be surprised to hear. <clears throat> uh, if you've been to some of the other talks about using Pixie uh, for things other than non-mobile apps, because originally Pixie was designed specifically for mobile app development, right? If you go to things like, well, a lot of the documentation, certainly the original Pixie draft, it talks about, I mean, the title is for native apps. Uh, so it's uh, not surprising that most of the documentation that you find online, guidance from best, you know, various books and whatnot, talks about Pixie in terms of mobile applications. But it's not really just for mobile apps. Um, once again, best current practices um, 
basically say that everybody using uh, the authorization grant should use Pixie. And honestly, why not? It's basically free. And it just adds another additional layer of security. But it's especially recommended, as you see here, it was called out in the best current practices as though it was originally for native apps, it applies to all kinds, including web apps, including single page apps. So open and shut, start using Pixie for single page apps too. Now, uh, what should you do when you see this error? This is one of the things that's sort of a, an interesting question, I suppose. You get, uh, you're using your public client, that's to say your single page app, and you see an access token that's expired error. Well, you're going to have to renew your token, right? So how do you do it? Well, typically, with a back-end application, server-side application, you would go about, you go about getting a refresh token. Now, uh, why shouldn't you use it in a front-end app? Um, well, this goes to one of the things that was actually brought up by both Brock Allen yesterday and Philippe Durick about the relative insecurity of storing secrets, especially long-lived secrets like refresh tokens, in the browser. This is the, the inherent insecurity of doing that. And um, essentially, the risk here is what single page apps fundamentally uh, are, I mean, as, as was very thoroughly and, and expertly described yesterday, have more inherent risks in the way that they're able to keep things secure, um, and especially when it comes to things like cross-site scripting and uh, anything that could subject uh, a web application to being, uh, having extra code injected into it that could cause secrets to be ex uh, exfiltrated, which is a kind of a wonky term, I suppose, for stealing and being used offline, uh, that would be a very dangerous thing to have in the browser. Anything that can be used for a long time, especially, out of the browser context, out of the original context where it was issued, would be very dangerous to have. So the le less is more in this case, right? Uh, refresh tokens live for a very long time, so therefore they're inherently much more dangerous than short-lived access tokens. And really the important thing is you might not actually need it. So it really depends on your exact context. Um, the cool thing about this particular type of client is you can make use of the fact that your users were logged in with uh, a cookie that is still present in the browser, right? So they were logged into their authorization server, and presumably their authorization server remembers the fact that they were logged in. It issued them a cookie that lives in the authorization server domain, right? And so that essentially represents a session in that authorization server. And also presumably that authorization server remembers the fact that they granted uh, consent for the scopes that were asked for by that client. So generally speaking, when that client goes back to the server, there's not, need, not really any need for interaction because they've already got a cookie, they've already authenticated themselves, they've already provided consent. So generally speaking, the authorization code flow would just return immediately with a 302 redirect with a new code that you can use to fetch a new token. And so that's very convenient in this case for renewing tokens because now you're able to skip, essentially, the need for a refresh token. Instead, you can rely on the fact that that cookie's present. And uh, of course, this only really applies when your access token lifetime is shorter than that session lifetime. It wouldn't really make sense otherwise. And um, you're doing this all in the same context of the browser that you first logged in with, all that, of course. Now, one of the important details here that you'll need to remember is uh, there's an extra parameter that's not necessarily super well known. Uh, called prompt equals none that you can pass to the authorization endpoint. And what that tells the authorization endpoint is that you really don't want any kind of interaction whatsoever. So if, for example, that session isn't still valid, or um, for some reason this consent wasn't saved for those scopes, or, or whatever reason, or anything that would require interaction of the user, you can say prompt equals none, and rather than actually trying to get that user to be uh, interacting with the authorization server, it just responds immediately with an error telling telling the client what exactly went wrong. And that's much more useful in a programmatic context whenever you're trying to silently obtain an authorization code. In this case, you, you would do that in a, in a hidden iframe. Uh, it sounds a little, I don't know, 
uh, not fashionable, I suppose, to talking about iframes and hidden iframes, but it's remarkably effective and is actually the means by which the specs suggest you do quite a lot of things is by using hidden iframes. So fashionable though it may not be, still actually a very remarkably useful technique. So basically using this, you don't need refresh tokens. And that's a very good thing. So one less thing to have to worry about getting lost. All right, so another concern, this is actually something that I'm actually happy to say, uh, hasn't been covered yet. <laughs> Everybody else has actually said that most of the same things that I've already mentioned, so, so, several people have. So this is something new. Um, this is a concern that um, is uh, generally applicable, but it's especially, I think, especially concerning uh, in a single page app. So let's, let's say you've got multiple resource servers you're working with. In this case, you've got three. Um, say those three resource servers have different scopes associated with the uh, resources that they are working with. Resource one has scopes A and B, two has C, and three has D, right? Now you could go to the resource server, I'm sorry, go to the optimization server and ask for all four of those scopes at once and get one single token, you can use that token to interact with all three of those ser resource servers. Totally legit, you can. However, it's not necessarily the best idea because what happens if three there gets compromised? Well, if it gets compromised, then any access token that it receives, it can then replay to any other of those resource servers and have full authority of all those scopes. Essentially, it can act as a rogue client and do things on that user's behalf that that client probably doesn't want, the user probably doesn't want to do. So that could be a real security risk. And there is a, this is a topic, a, top, a fairly large topic in the best current practices about ways to mitigate this kind of problem. Now, unfortunately, the mitigation techniques that they talk about in the best current practices are not necessarily very applicable but to single page apps. Because, well, honestly, you can't necessarily do mutual TLS in a single page app when it's driven by end users. I mean, it's just simply not possible, right? So, or, or some of the other techniques too. I mean, it's just unfortunately not likely to be possible. And so there's a simpler technique that I'm suggesting here. And this goes back to um, that same technique I just mentioned about token renewal. Basically, you can do the same thing. Once you've gotten authorization from the authorization server for those four scopes, all the scopes you expect to need, you've gotten consent from the user for them, you can actually go back to the authorization server multiple times, once for each resource server you actually intend to work with, and get lesser scoped tokens, scopes, uh, tokens that only have the scopes that are necessary for each resource server you plan on working with, right? So in this case, you have one for A, uh, resource server one, this has A and B, one for resource server two with C, and one for resource server three with D. Now in this context, Resource server three gets compromised, and yes, that's a bad thing, obviously, it's gonna be a bad thing no matter what, but it's less bad for the client because now at least resource server three can't do anything more than what they could already do by being compromised. They can't take those access tokens and go use them to exploit even further. It essentially, it constrains the damage. So that's a good thing. And it's, fairly, it's honestly fairly easy to do. Uh, it's, not, it's not exactly um, asking a whole lot more of the client to go this extra step and get those specifically scoped tokens. So I think we should do it. Um, now, another concern that has been raised a few times, um, good sessions on so far, has to do with um, single logout or, maintain, or basically binding uh, the session at the RP with the session at the OP so that when the user logs out at the OP or some other RP, all the sessions that were established during that original session would be logged out at the same time. Um, there's, I mean, it's, it's a challenge, right? I mean, there's a lot of different problems with doing this. It's, it's tricky. Um, and there's a whole spec on it. Uh, it's a draft, actually, but uh, it's, it's been a lot around for quite a long time. It's this OpenID Connect session management spec. Um, and they have recommendations for ways to do this. Um, I have a few, well, let's just go over what they suggest. 
So they say it's possible to repeat the authentication request of prompt equals none, like I mentioned earlier. Um, and it's, but they don't recommend doing it that often because it's problematic on mobile devices that are becoming increasingly popular. It's funny, this phrasing, uh, you can tell how old this is. Uh, the original time, the first time it was added to the draft was about seven or eight years ago. Pretty sure it's become popular. Um, but uh, as you can see, what they suggest doing to avoid all that network traffic is pulling a hidden OP iframe from the RP iframe with a rest origin restricted post message. <laughs> yeah. Um, is there, I don't know, has anybody ever tried implementing that in the room? Yeah, I have. It's not fun. <clears throat> so basically, what you have to do to follow their recommendation is you have an application that has two iframes in it, that's these two boxes. There's an iframe from the RP context and an iframe from the OP context. And basically, there's a HTML5 post message API that says you can call cross domain uh, with this very constricted post message mechanism. And you basically uh, can pass data along. In this case, the data is ABCD, it's just some arbitrary string. The point is, it represents the session that was handed to the RP when it was first established as part of the OIDC flow, right? And this iframe that lives in the OP provider, it takes that data and it uses some JavaScript internally to monitor to the session on the OP and see if there's any difference between the data that was that the RP is handing it and the current value of the session on the OP. Now the trick here, the difficulty, is essentially you, the original premise. If you look, if you look very cursory at the scope, you might think, "Oh, uh, answer at the spec." You might think that the uh, all you have to do is read the current session cookie, the one that actually was established when you first logged into the OP, and compare it to the value that was handed to it from the RP. Well, no, actually, you can't because. Presumably, your OP is doing the right thing and setting an HTTP only header on that session cookie, which means you can't read it from JavaScript. <laughs> it's going to make this a little more difficult, right? Um, so you have to have a separate cookie, uh, a separate cookie that isn't the session but reflects the session, right? And so uh, that's another cookie you have to maintain on the OP. It's not sensitive because it can't have the HTTP only flag, but it has to in some way mirror the status of the actual sensitive value. It also can't have any personal identifying information in it because for the same reason, anything that, that would be considered sensitive. So um, you have to go uh, maintain these two th different things and do message passing, multiple iframes. It's really, honestly, kind of a mess, I think. Um, I don't think it's worth it. I think there's a simpler mechanism we can have, which is based on the next part of what the spec says. As you can see here, it's very similar to that previous slide. The difference is it doesn't have that top portion. Essentially, the next step that would happen after a change was detected in this theoretical construct that they have you go through, um, when the change is detected, they would have you initiate that background authorization uh, using a hidden iframe, with prompt equals none. Well, I suggest that instead of triggering that additional check, that, back, that actual network call from this very complicated monitoring of a JavaScript, you know, through JavaScript of a cookie value, instead basically have this triggered based on uh, some user interaction of the application, right? So it's not particularly complicated. Let's imagine you have an event handler for click events or button key press events, something like that. Now, obviously, you wouldn't want to have that tri triggered on every click event or every key press event. That would you'd flood your server, and that's the whole point. That's what the, what the spec's trying to get you to avoid. They, they certainly don't want to do that, especially on a mobile device, but really on any device. Um, and now, the way you avoid that is you simply bake in a uh, grace period, essentially a, a, an interval where you only do it once in that context. So, say every 30 seconds. Every 30 seconds, you check it, and then if you get more more than one. Uh, uh, request to check the session in that same 30 second inter interval, then you just don't do it. You wait until the next 30 second interval. Not particularly complicated, and it's way simpler to implement than the spec would have you uh, go through. Uh, it pretty much works with it, just about every IDP. Now, one of the things that's important to note the spec doesn't call this out, I think it ought to, 
but I actually have a, uh, remarkably enough, a suggestion to use the implicit grant. I don't think it's completely useless after all. The, the difference here is the implicit grant in this context only gives you back an ID token. So essentially if you use response type, response type is maybe a fairly lesser used option in the, um, in the grant context. Um, but here you can specify you don't want an access token, you only want an ID token if you say response type equals ID token. And I think if you do that, then the, the security concerns implied with the implicit grant aren't really a concern. And so you get the benefits of a single network call and um, you still get all the details you need. Because honestly, in this case, whenever you're doing session monitoring, all you really care about is the claims that are baked into the ID token. You don't need another access token. Your access tokens are fine. All you need to know is, is the cookie that was issued by the OP, whenever you establish your session, is it still valid? And if it is, um, give me back an ID token that's updated to reflect the current state of the user from based on that session, right? And that will be represented by the claims that are included in that access token. I'm oh, sorry, in, that, by, in the claims in that ID token. Now, um, one of the things you'll want to do there is make sure that whenever you parse that ID token, you, the claims, the subject claim in particular, that matches the same subject that was first authenticated to your OP. Because it's possible, and maybe slightly unlikely, but it's still possible that the user actually logged out and then logged in with a different user in the OP before they uh, triggered the interaction. So anything that would cause essentially a um, concern for the RP that would uh, suggest that they need to log the user out or prompt them to do something different, basically respond to some invalid state of the OP. That can be detected by simply getting back an, an, a fresh ID token uh, and looking at those claims. So <clears throat> now <clears throat> there are, uh, you know, these, these best practices are nice in theory, but of course somebody has to implement them. And it's not necessarily easy to do so. It takes a lot of developer work and there could be a lot of mistakes. And Mistakes lead to security vulnerabilities, so it's better to use libraries when you can. And um, cool thing is, I've discovered there are. Uh, yeah, so yesterday, Brock Allen actually uh, presented one of his libraries I didn't know about until I came here, and I probably would have used it if I had known about it earlier. But uh, since I didn't, <clears throat> I worked on some that I will share with you now. Although uh, they're obviously not exclusive. The main thing, <clears throat> the main point to drive home is that whatever libraries you use are addressing some of these best practice concerns, right? So here's one of them, one of them that I wrote. So this is that OIDC session check library. This is a very simple one. It basically helps you implement that uh, session management uh, simplified uh, suggestion. Now it's, this is basically all the code you'd have to add to your application. Um, hmm. uh, those dots on the side weren't there when I first did this, but that's all right. But basically, the idea is all you have to do is provide the client ID, your main authorization endpoint, the, the user uh, subject, that's, that's the user who's currently logged in. What you want to do when the session is no longer valid, that's an invalid session handler there. Simplest case would just be log the user out of that RP. Uh, the cooldown period, that's that interval that I mentioned. So in this case, it would be five seconds, 30 seconds a minute. You get to choose how often you want to check with the server. And then you just add some event listeners. Uh, decide when you call trigger session check as soon as you do. That will happen. And uh, that's it, really. Now, the cool thing about this is you can add this to any web application, not actually just a single page app. Uh, any web application at all, uh, you know, it could be uh, with a back end uh, that required tokens originally, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, anything where there's a session at the OP that you want to check to make sure the subject matches the same one that was logged in um, with your RP. And, and with that, uh, that's all you need. So it's actually remarkably simple and easy, easy to add. Now another, another library we've heard a bit about here at Identiverse is AppAuth which is a great library for Pixie clients. It's, it's built by, uh, originally backed by Google, and it's open source. Um, there, it appears, if you look at their uh, site, 
that it was really meant to help people build mobile clients. And this goes back to the whole background of Pixie in general, right? Is that it's there specifically for mobile clients. Now, um, the JavaScript version they have, so there's three versions, as you can see here. There's one for Android, iOS, and JavaScript. Now, clearly, the Android and iOS ones are for mobile apps. But the JavaScript one, yeah, if you look at their website, it's actually remarkably designed, uh, supposedly marketed, uh, described in terms of mobile apps, too. Uh, here, I mean, there are several frameworks designed for using JavaScript for building mobile apps, like Cordova and uh, PhoneGap. Well, there are a few others. Um, but they also talk about using it for like, things like Electron apps, and basically Node.js apps, and, oh yes, by the way, also web apps, which I found kind of interesting. Um, it basically meant that because they're so generic, they weren't particularly tailored for working with JavaScript apps, which um, meant that it's a great baseline for Pixie, right? I mean, they certainly provide all the constructs you need for doing a Pixie flow, but it wasn't especially easy to find where what you needed to do in a web app context. So I made it easier. Uh, I basically took that core package, web auth, uh, the app auth help, uh, app auth package, and packaged it up, packaged it up in a um, helper, right? And this is uh, essentially re reduces a lot of the boilerplate that you would have to add to your application if you were just using app auth directly. And it also, I mean, to be honest, it simplifies a lot of it because it's not super clear what you need to do in this context. Now, yeah, my uh, slide got a little messed up in the translation here. It was supposed to be a little bit more readable, but that's all right. You get the gist. The main thing is all you have to do to use the library is provide some environmental details, like uh, the client you're using, the various endpoints of your authorization server, where, which resource servers you plan on using, and I'll get to that in a minute and then what to do whenever your tokens are available. Um, start making resource server calls, presumably. And also you get the claims back from the ID token. So it's very, very simple, right? There's really very little you need to do uh, to start using Pixie, to start adding Pixie to your uh, single page app with this library. Now, as far as RS requests go, now they're not very hard, right? Uh, I mean, can look something like this. If you're using jQuery, um, you just make your provide your URL, add your access token as a bearer header. It's not too complicated. But what happens if the access, access token expires? We get back to that invalid token error that we showed earlier. How does your code res respond to that? Now, you could add some failure handling logic, something kind of like this. I cut off a little bit, but still, you get the gist. Essentially, you have to add a whole bunch of extra checking on the response to make sure that if, the, if you did get an error, if it was a certain type of error that you could possibly react to in a way that the spec suggests you might be able to, which is to say retry, get a new token, and then retry the request immediately. <sighs> yeah, you could do that. Um, but it does add a lot of complexity to every place in your code that you might want to make RS requests. I mean, even if you wrapped all this up in a function, it would still have to mean that you'd have to call that function everywhere in your application instead of simply making the request. Now, what if it looked like this instead, right? This is certainly much simpler. Uh, it's almost reminiscent of what it would be like if you were using cookies because it's just you don't have to worry about it, right? Now, um, this could be possible because of something that's actually unique to app auth helper. That's something I'm pretty excited about. Uh, I call it an identity proxy. Now, this is kind of a cool idea, something I'm pretty excited about showing you guys. Essentially, a service worker. Now, now a service worker is a fairly new thing in the land of web, web applications and web technologies. And a service worker is essentially an extra JavaScript process that lives in the browser. And it has a lot of power. It's basically able to intercept every single network request that's issued by your application and it can alter it before it leaves the browser. And what App Off Helper does is it installs a service worker that's able to transparently intercept every single RS request that your applica application code wants to make and add an access token to it. Now, more importantly than that, it can react to expired token errors and automatically 
renew the access token and replay the request. And once it's renewed, your application code has no idea that any of that happened. It just works. So in addition to helping you manage token renewal, AppAuth Helper is designed to help you follow the best practice around uh, token leakage. So essentially, you just declare which RS endpoints you want to work with, like these here, for example, these two on the bottom. And uh, it will detect that you're making a request to one or the other. And it will simply include the one that's appropriate for that request. Now, here's what the actual service worker code is. Now, I don't really expect you all to follow all the details or read every line here. But really, the main point is even the service worker code itself is really not super complicated. Essentially, just check to see if the this is the meat of the implementation, really. Uh, it just says the checks for the see if the request is coming in, matches the configured resource, one of those configured resource servers. If it finds that it does match, then it responds with a custom, it overrides the response with a custom event and adds the access token to the request, sends the request down the wire. If it detects that error, that says it can be recovered. Again, this is based on the spec. The spec says an invalid token error can be retried and it doesn't really suggest how you would do that very easily, but this is how, a one way. Essentially, you check for the headers to see if there's an invalid token, and then you trigger a renewal process. Now, the renewal process in AppAuth Helper's case is using that silent method with the iframe, and expecting the AS session to still be valid, all that. But it doesn't really matter. In theory, this could actually be using a refresh token, too, if that was your implementation. But the point is, is the renewal, a token is renewed. You add a new, you add the updated access token to the request, retry it again. And your code has no idea that that happened. Now, I'm going to go through a uh, demo. Obviously, I don't have a computer in front of me. So sadly, this won't be a, an actual live running demo, but we'll see what it looks like uh, with two pictures. <laughs> so it's a sort of demo. So here at the top, you can see that there is uh, some very simple code that actually makes an RS request. And essentially, it takes that JSON response and puts it on the page. It's a very beautiful application. I'm very proud of it. Um, you can see the top of it right there. That's that gray box. Essentially, that's what the response looks like. It doesn't really matter the details. Here you can see some network traffic. We're going to go through the details of that network traffic. See so exactly, just exactly what happened, how we were able to go from that top request into an actual response without having to include an access token. Now, the first thing you see here is we go through an authorization request. Uh, this uh, is Pixie. As you can see here, there's a code challenge and code challenge method. That's your core Pixie uh, portion. And um, here you can see that because we have this iPlanet Directory Pro cookie, that's actually this particular AS's session identifier. That is going to, uh, since it's valid and this particular client has already approved the scopes, we got a 302 redirect immediately with a code included. And we're able to use that code to call the access to the token endpoint. And uh, we provide, again, the last half of Pixie, which is the code and code verifier. And we get back our ID token and access token with those two scopes. Now, those two scopes are essentially the aggregate of all the scopes, like I showed before, A, B, C, and D, right? This is the aggregate of all the scopes of all the resource servers you plan on working with. Um, and that was in order to gain consent. And now, now we're going to actually try and call uh, that login endpoint. That's the actual one that the service worker intercepted. And we're going to find, fire off another authorization request. This is actually, again, triggered by the service worker transparently. And in this case, we're only requesting one scope, the one scope that's appropriate for the particular resource server we're working with. Again, with, with Pixie involved, we get back a new access token, that E1UE. It's a, it's a new one, right? It's a different access token. And we present that. As you can see here, there's, a, there's the authorization header with our access token included, just automatically, right? It's very easy to use. Now, the way this works behind the scenes, not something you'd actually have to know about or care about if you really are interested. 
is this actually stores this in browser storage in the index DB option. Now, I don't know, this, this might not be as well known as some of the others. Local storage and session storage, those are more, probably more popular than index DB as a browser storage mechanism, because mainly because it's simpler to work with. Honestly, the index DB API is terrible. Well, it's, I don't find it very friendly. But I use the index DB API because that's the only mechanism that service workers have for interacting with persistent storage in the browser. Because some interesting side note about service workers, they can only work with asynchronous APIs. Nothing synchronous. Um, so you know, there's no DOM interaction. Can't use local storage or session storage from a service worker context. Um, so the only option you have if you want to store something in the browser is index that, that the service worker can read is an index DB. And here you can see that's where I'm putting it. And that's the structure of the, uh, the data. This is an interesting aside. Now, what happens now that I've got this in here? What if that access token expires? Right? I mean, that does happen, right? Maybe it's very short lived. Maybe it's only, in this case, I actually configured it to only be two seconds long. So I refreshed the page right after I did this. And now I get this error, right? Invalid token error when I call that info login. Now, in this case, uh, the service worker does no problem. It intercepts that, it, it detects that error, replays the authorization request gets back a new token and submits the new token to the um, uh, login endpoint. And that is that. Uh, it essentially, it just works. Now, uh, once again, um, app auth helper and uh, OADC session check. Those are both uh, open source libraries that you can add uh, to your application and helps um, follow some of these best practices. Now, um, something I wanted to add, uh, based on some of the talks we've heard here at Dendiverse, um, you know, around security, this whole premise of building single page apps as clients. Um, there's a lot of uh, concern over whether browsers can keep secrets and what sorts of risks they are um, likely to be subject to. Um, Personally, I think, obviously, I mean, quite clearly, I think you can build single page apps as clients. Um, certainly the risks are, there are real risks, but I don't think they're necessarily specific to single page apps. The main risk associated with any web app, especially the main risk associated with a single page app, is going to be cross-site scripting. And essentially, no matter what your technique is for building a web-based client, if you have cross-site scripting errors, you're pretty much done, right? There's nothing that you can do short of fixing that problem uh, if you have a cross-site scripting. Because once you have cross-site scripts going on, even if uh, you're using a, your backend had a cookie, you know, if you're interacting with a cookie with a backend, and it was actually the backend that had to fetch all the tokens, if you have a cross-site scripting attack, the user that injected that script, they can do everything that that client can do. So anything destructive that that token could be used for could be just as easily used with a cookie, transparently, they don't, the attacker doesn't actually have to read that cookie. The attacker doesn't actually have to have the token in hand. All they have to do is trigger the, the request, and they know that the, the cookie would be included or the um, token would be included. So uh, really, you need to try and uh, prevent any kind of cross-site scripting, which, of course, is no, a no-brainer. It's not like I'm telling you anything new there. Um, one of the things, though, that is unique to single page apps operating as clients, and this is something I will concede, is the uh, danger of exfiltration, right? And that is that is something that, say, same site cookies with HTTP only flags and secure headers, that's a, the secure flag, that wouldn't be subject to. So, uh, whereas this would, I mean, theoretically, if you got a cross-site scripting error, uh, whatever tokens you did have in the index DB storage or whatever storage mechanism you use would be subject to exfiltration. And here, uh, this is where um, Philippe's uh, discussion yesterday was actually very interesting. Um, and I think if that is a concern, again, here we're talking about the specific concern of you have been exploited by cross-site scripting. And so you're going to have a very bad time no matter what. But if you're also worried about 
exfiltration in particular after that's been occurred, uh, after that's occurred, because that's the only really time it could have occurred, then um, what you would need to do is uh, something like what he described, which is to say isolate the tokens in a different origin and and only uh, interact with that separate origin, like a client, like a sub-origin domain. Again, you should watch his talk, really. I mean, it's really what it comes down to. You. He really goes into great detail about how you would isolate these tokens. Now, the interesting thing I think I can add to that particular discussion is with the service worker concept. Now, you, you might recall that the application code that's being, of course, lives in the primary domain that didn't have access to the token. It didn't need it. Is a service worker was dealing with all the code, with all the, with all the access token handling. Okay. Well, it occurred to me after listening to his talk yesterday that this could be some real symbiotic use here. Now, I haven't built this yet, but I could easily see building a feature on top of what we've already done that essentially allowed you to make use of his suggestion in a way that's very easy. Essentially, the service worker could call out, could handle all the interaction that he's proposing as far as message passing to the child domain, and the application code doesn't have to worry about that implementation at all. All it has to know is know that the tokens are going to be managed somewhere else by the service worker, and it's not its a problem. And, and by doing that, you can actually make sure that no code that lives in that browser, that lives in that origin domain, whether it got there by legitimate purposes or whether it got there by cross-site scripting, was able to access those tokens. So there's your exfiltration. There's your, you know, solve their exfiltration. So there you go. Anyway, that's an interesting idea. I think we can maybe work on adding that later. But essentially, that's all uh, I've got for now. Thank you all for coming. I'm happy to, I've got eight minutes for questions, so I have a little bit of extra time. So, go ahead. Sorry, yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> Felipe's got a question. All right. Thanks for the presentation. That's loud. Uh, for, well, I have two, one comment and one question. Um, your last remark, I think the service worker, as far as I know, is already an isolated environment. So your tokens would already be isolated from the main application, and there's no shared storage, no shared access. So that's a very nice uh, benefit from doing it in that way. So that's a nice win. My question was something totally different about the OIDC session management. Is there a reason why we cannot simply expose a token introspection-like endpoint, which we can call with the SHR from the browser? Is there a talk? Well, yes. I mean, essentially, token introspection requires credentials, right? Currently, according to the spec, you can't just have generic um, uh, anonymous token introspection uh, because that would be, well, there's actually a couple, couple of problems. <laughs> One, access tokens don't necessarily imply uh, any relationship to the session on the OP. So the int token introspection generally is with access tokens. And even if it did, uh, token introspection endpoints generally would be um, well, I, I, I guess it would be, maybe you're talking about token introspection that's completely not related to access token introspection, but instead maybe ID token introspection or something. Uh, right, right. So if that's what you mean, right. Then, um, yeah, possibly. That, that doesn't exist in the spec anywhere. Um, you know, maybe we could change that. Maybe we could alter it. But I mean, I, I'm not sure which, how much difference there would really be, honestly, between that. And, I mean, it's essentially a network call that does essentially the same thing, right? Um, yeah, yeah, maybe we can talk about it afterward. Sure. Anybody else have a question? Oh, yeah. Hi. Uh, are there any particular browser requirements for the server? Ah, great, great question. Uh, I have tested this with all the latest versions of the uh, browsers, including Opera, Safari, Firefox, Edge, and Chrome. Everything works fine. Um, now, I will say, full, full disclosure, uh, if you're running anything in private mode, or incognito, whatever you want to call it, sometimes things get a little strange. Firefox, for some reason, doesn't allow service workers in private mode. I really can't fathom why this is the case. Chrome does. Uh, but anyway, it's, the point is, as long as you're all the normal operating environment of all the major browsers, yes, it works fine. Uh, anybody else have a question? <laughs> 
Are there any constraints with using service workers in combining with cross origin requests? That's a great question. That was one of my initial worries, actually. Um, turns out, no. Turns out it works fine. Uh, cross origin requests, uh, I, I have to say, by the way, service workers is a bear to work with. I, mean, I really don't recommend, uh, <laughs> well, prepare yourself, essentially, if you're going to delve into actually using service workers. It took me quite a while. Um, at first, I thought it didn't work because I just couldn't get anything to work with service workers. But it turns out, yes, it works fine with cross origin requests. Uh, otherwise, I really none of this would be feasible. So, yeah. So my question is more on the user influence point. Let's say that whoever issues the, to the token, uh, the response on that is encrypted in the form of JWD, and you need to decrypt it with a private key. So how would you go about that on the browser? Right. Well, according to the spec, the ID token isn't encrypted. It can't be. It's, uh, it's signed. Of course, it would have to be signed. but. Um, it has to be, the whole point of it is for it to be readable to the RP. And if it's encrypted, it, it couldn't be readable, right? I mean, um, but based on the spec, now that you said the user info endpoint, I'm not sure what you mean there. Generally, that's also not encrypted either. That's just going to be a JSON response that you get back from the um, access token, by including the access token in it. But in either case, that's not a problem I've seen uh, based on the spec behavior. So um, we can talk a little more later for some details on that. But I, yeah, I'm not familiar with that being a normal problem. Oh, you got a question over here? Thanks. Hi, thanks for the presentation. So I have a question really specific for the uh, access token package. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned like uh, uh, if the application trying to talk with uh, different resource servers, uh, the application trying to get uh, different access token with different uh, set of scopes. Um, do you guys have any specific use cases already production for end users? Say, okay, I'm going to talk with 100 resource servers and the 100 requests get from this uh, um, authoring server get different tokens. I mean, it's kind of Nightmare. Uh, oh, yeah. No, you're right. That would be quite a lot. Now, it really comes down to what you decide as a client you want to trust. I mean, essentially, with AppAuth Helper, the way I've implemented it, it's up to you to decide how to group together the resource server endpoints. Now, presumably, if you actually have 100 resource servers that are uniquely uh, <laughs> distinct and that, you know, there's a real trust concern between them. Well, that's quite a problem. Um, but uh, more likely than not, there would be categories of them you could group together where you might be less concerned about sharing tokens between them. Again, this might be a, an implementation decision, but you can decide that. I mean, it's, it's a, an option. You can you basically just scope down the uh, pattern that you want to apply to the, identify those sets of resource server endpoints. And then once you've scoped it down to the point where uh, groups of them fit within that, then, then, the sh then those tokens will be shared between those groups. Okay, thank you. Um, I have another use case actually in our um, uh, work. Basically, some of the resource servers have to talk with other resource servers. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have any, any similar use cases? Well, if that's a legitimate use, then, I mean, uh, oftentimes, yeah, you might find something like a token transformation uh, service, uh, or, or there might be client credentials between them. I mean, that's, that's a very common pattern, too, where you have each, each let's say, microservice or something. Each, server, each resource server would have its own access token that it got from client credentials, or, or possibly that it, it called out to a uh, secure token server to get to transform one token into another. It's, um, I don't think, if, if there's a legitimate use to talk from one to the other, then that's certainly no problem. And there's no need for you to worry about that from a client perspective. That's all essentially like inside baseball as far as the resource servers are concerned. This is really how a client can be proactive in the security of its users uh, and, and making sure that it, it's doing all that it can to um, make sure that the resource servers are not exposed to anything more than they need, basically. Yeah, uh, but in terms of, you know, client credential flow, uh, it sounds like it kind of administrate the token, right? So, which means um, 
Uh, so let's say if user logs in on the app, mm -hmm. and the app is trying to talk with resource of one, and definitely he wants to talk with resource to resource of two. Mm -hmm. In this case, resource of one want to talk up with resource two or resource of two right. on behalf of this user. Right. Well, in that case, you would want to use a secure token. Uh, basically, they can just get a scope down token based on the original one. But I think we're out of time, actually, so we can talk more about that after. Um, if anybody else has any other questions, I'll be happy to chat with you afterward. So thanks very much.